Well, good morning and welcome to this online service for Life Bible Fellowship Church. Now, many of you might be new to LBF Church and maybe our online service is the only way you've participated in church with us. Well, I wanna invite you to connect with us and learn more about who we are. If you text NEW to 909-863-8122 or follow the link below, you can get more information about LBF Church. It will also help you stay informed about how and when we will start meeting in person. Whether you're new to LBF or have been around for years, make sure you're connected with us on social media. We seem to be in a very dynamic time for our church. As you might know, we're trying to plan how and when we can meet in person again. And we are posting content every single week that will keep you up to date and with any plans we're making to reopen LBF. Make sure you follow us on Facebook and subscribe right here on YouTube. Now, we're gonna take some time this morning to talk about what's been going on around our country. Um, many of you are aware that our inboxes and, and our news feeds have been flooded with news about George Floyd. And on May 25th, a Minnesota man named George Floyd died after, during an arrest, a police officer knelt on his neck for over eight minutes. This was not a normal police practice. Police officers and police organizations from all across the nation have spoken out and condemned the actions of this officer. He's been arrested and charged with murder. And actually other officers who were present at the time have been charged also. This was not just a case of questionable force. This is a case case of clear misconduct that led to a completely unnecessary death. And in the aftermath, there's been grief and anger and protests and riots. George Floyd, a black man being killed in this way by a white police officer has opened scabs of pain for many many people in our country. The grief is real, the anger is real, and the cry for justice is real and is also very appropriate. The cry for justice is appropriate because we believe that all human beings bear the image of God. And this is why racism is such a horrific evil. It's evil because when we practice it, we're dehumanizing a person that God considers to be precious to him. Now, as Christians, it's our calling to grieve with those who grieve, to bridge gaps that divide us, and to advocate for justice in all places and for all people. As we process this, some people are just feeling really sad. Some people are enraged. Some people are scared. And probably some people just feel helpless. I mean, and here's what I, what I want to say. We don't all have to agree on exactly what it took to get us here And we don't even have to all agree on exactly how we move forward from here. But what's undeniable is that there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of hurt, and there's a lot of division in our country. And that should grieve us all and should move us as believers in Jesus to want to show compassion to those in need, to want to grow in our understanding, and to want to use our voices in sacrificial ways that benefit others. And when we ask the question, what's to be done? I encourage you to take some time this week to ask God to search your heart and to lead you and how he's calling you to respond. But right now we wanna take some time to do something that we can be absolutely confident that God is calling us to do. And that's to pray. We're gonna take a few minutes to pray in particular about three items. And number one, we wanna pray for justice to prevail, not only in the case of George Floyd, but in our nation as a whole. That as the prophet Amos said, let justice roll like water. Number two, we wanna pray for peace and comfort to those who are deeply grieved right now. Not only the friends and the family of George Floyd, but to others who have died, to others who are grieved because of their identification with him, and with people who are hurting. And number three, we wanna pray for God to open our hearts and to expose blind spots so that we can be more able to be a vessel and his love and grace to others. If you're with other people as you're watching this, uh, you can pray out loud in a group and take turns. If you're by yourself, you can just take this time to open yourself up before the Lord and open your heart to him but let's take this time now to pray to the God who is our only hope, our only peace, and our great healer.
Lord, we do just bring our hearts to you right now. We thank you that you are the God who sees all pain. You are also the God who reconciles us through Jesus, not only to yourself, but to one another. Father, I pray that you break down barriers in our church, in our state, in our nation, and in our world. Father, I pray that you open our hearts, that you lead us so that we won't be defensive, we won't be protective of our own space, but instead we'll open wide to others. Father, we pray for healing, we pray for your grace, we pray for your wisdom, and we do pray for justice to reign. And we pray that you work in our hearts so that we love justice even more than our own comfort. We love you and we entrust ourselves to you. And we also wanna especially entrust the family and friends of George Floyd to you, that you work in them, bringing them comfort and peace and grace during this time. In the name of our savior, Jesus, amen. And with that, I wanna invite you to engage now as we give our hearts to the Lord in a time of worship. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Bow at his feet. He 
is the end That frees me a weapon that conquers all anxiety
or forsake us your desire is to live through us 
so we surrender to that now. Pray that you would speak to us through your word this morning. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Lori Baez, and I'm here with a 60-second recap of where we've been in our King of the Kings series through the book of 1 Samuel. So here we go. Samuel was Israel's leader, prophet, and priest for years. Then when he got too old to continue, the people of Israel asked for a king. This was a rejection of the idea that God was their king. But in His mercy, God chose to give them what they asked for. God chose Saul, a tall and impressive man, to be Israel's first king. Saul was reluctant to take on this responsibility, and some of the Israelites didn't think he was the right man for the job. But when the time came for him to rally an army to save an Israelite city, he did so and was successful. This united the people behind him. Saul, now the ruler of Samuel, faded into the background. Before he left his role as judge, Samuel warned the people to serve the Lord and to not turn away from Him. It was a reminder that God is the one true ruler and no king would be able to protect them from judgment if they decided to do evil. That brings us to chapter 13, which is our passage today. Well, thanks so much, Lori, and that sets us up. And so I'm going to start our time in God's Word together just with the reading of God's Word in 1 Samuel chapter 13. So if you have a Bible out there in front of you, go ahead and open it up to 1 Samuel chapter 13. The reading of God's word is a significant thing that we do together. Um, I'm gonna give commentary on it later, but first we're just going to experience the reading of the very word of God from 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses one through 15. Saul was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 2,000 were with him at Michmash in, and in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah in Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel and with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers and soldiers as numerous as the sands on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash east of Beit Avon. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, they hid in caves and thickets, among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I compelled, I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of the people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Gibeah and Benjamin and Saul counted the men who were with him. They numbered about 600. This is God's word. 
And this is a passage where King Saul, the first king of Israel, disobeys. It's a passage about his disobedience. And here's the deal. Um, I I don't wanna make any excuses for Saul as we walk through this story. Um, There's no excuse for the disobedience that he does. I don't want us to look at excuses, but I do want us to look at the reason why Saul ends up disobeying as he does. And here's why I want us to look at that. Um, It's easy for us to look at Saul as the villain. King David is the good king, King Saul is the bad king. It's easy for us to look at him that way. And when we look at him that way, it's easy for us to distance ourselves from him. And one of the realities that this passage brings out is that we are not as different from Saul as we'd like to believe that we are. There's no excuse for what Saul did, but there are reasons for what Saul did. When Saul disobeyed God, in his mind, he had a really good reason for doing so. And in that way, he's like all the rest of us because nobody ever disobeys God without thinking they have a really good reason for doing so. We know this about obedience and disobedience just in general. No kid disobeys their parents just to disobey their parents. They do it because they believe they have a very good reason for doing it. No kid ever snuck an extra cookie just to be rebellious. They sneak the extra cookie because they believe they have a very good reason for disobeying mom and dad. And that reason may be as simple as I'm hungry or I like cookies or this rule is unreasonable. We don't disobey as children unless in our minds we have a good reason for doing so. And it's the same as adults. For most of us, we we don't disobey just to disobey. We disobey because we believe we have a very good reason for doing so. And so we lie. So we get outbursts of anger. So we feed our hungers even if they're sinful. We do all those things, not simply because we wanna disobey God, but because we believe we have a good reason for doing that. And as we walk through this passage and see what Saul led, what led Saul to the point of his disobedience of God, we not only get insight into ourselves about what leads us to those destructive choices, but we also get insight into ourselves of what would empower us towards obedience in really difficult situations. So let's talk about Saul's situation. And so here's the deal. As we lead up to chapter 13, Saul is the king of Israel and things thus far have actually been going pretty well for him. His his kingship is off to a good start. There is a city called Jabesh, an Israelite city that was attacked by the Ammonites and Saul heroically goes and delivers them. And after he goes and delivers them, all of Israel, even the people who were doubtful of Saul's ability to lead them, all of them rally behind Saul as the king of Israel. But even as these good things are happening, an old rival emerges, the Philistines. The Philistines already showed up earlier in 1 Samuel, back in chapter four, and they'll show up throughout the book of 1 Samuel. They're a frequent antagonist for the Israelites and they show back up in this passage. Now our passage begins with actually something odd in verse one. The the part that you heard me read from the New International Version says that Saul was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned for 42 years. Um, That's what the NIV has and that's what some other translations have. But some translations of the Bible, maybe the one that you have in front of you, says something different because the Hebrew text that we get our English translation from is kind of obscure on this point. Some of the translations just say, Saul was one year old when he became king and he reigned for two years. Which whatever we think about his kingship, we know that that doesn't sound quite right. That can't be exactly what happened. And probably in the end, what happened is some of these Hebrew manuscripts that we have, that they were, the, uh, they, they either weren't kept well or there were mistakes going on in them. So we don't have the full information about what's going on here. So I say that just in case you're reading a different translation and wondering what's going on with this. The passage simply starts by establishing that Saul is the king and now by walking in, starting in chapter 13, to what his reign was like. And as I mentioned, as he 
comes into this part of his kingship, the Philistines reemerge and Saul emerges against them. And his son, Jonathan, we know he's more than one year old because he has an adult son who's a soldier. Jonathan goes and attacks a Philistine outpost. And it says that this made the Israelites obnoxious to the Philistines. This set them at odds with each other. So it was game on and the Philistines come against Saul. But Saul summons the soldiers, summons all Israel. Every able-bodied Israelite man, come on for the battle. And they gather together with Saul at Gilgal, but the Philistines come out in force. It says that they had 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sands of the seashore. They far outnumbered, and their weapons were far more numerous than the Israelites. And so as this happened, the Israelites got afraid. They, they started to scatter. Talked about the idea that they're finding pits to hide in. They're finding caves to hide out. They're going between rocks. They're going into cisterns. They're scattering around trying to stay safe. Maybe they're dodging arrows from the Philistines that they sometimes shoot at random just to see if they can catch a stray Israelite who's not being careful. This is a perilous situation. And as this goes on, it becomes evident that Samuel had told Saul, in seven days, I will come there. Samuel was the prophet and priest of Israel. And the idea of Samuel showing up was that he would offer sacrifices to God, would seek the favor of God on behalf of the army and seek direction from God on what the attack was meant to look like. And so as Saul and his men are waiting for this, the passage says they grew increasingly fearful. They are afraid for their lives. And as they're afraid for their lives, they're waiting for Samuel, the prophet and the priest to show up. And a day goes by and a night goes by and no Samuel. And a new day dawns and they continue to hide and they continue to scatter and they continue to say, shh, don't make too much noise. And day goes by and night goes by on day two and still no Samuel. Day three, no Samuel. Day four, no Samuel. Day five, six, seven, still no Samuel. He's not there and he's supposed to be there. And at the end of day seven, more of the soldiers who are around Saul say, you know what? We're out of here. And you can imagine another soldier saying, hey, where are you guys going? And they say, you know what? We've waited long enough. We're not going to be able to defeat those guys. And Samuel the prophet hasn't even showed up so that God will bless what's going on here. We're heading home and Saul starts to panic. He realizes the situation that he's in. He's got at least three big problems going on. Problem number one is that he is outmatched by the Philistine army. Problem number two is that his own men are starting to lose heart and scatter. And problem number three is that Samuel has not yet shown up to seek the Lord on his behalf. And so Saul, pressed into this situation, decides it's time to take matters into his own hands. So instead of waiting for Samuel to come and offer the sacrifice, Saul authorizes the sacrifices himself. He says, let's get it done, even though Samuel's not here to do it. Now, by the way, it's worth just a pause here to try to take this in because as we're reading the story, the the idea that Saul is authorizing these sacrifices, probably it, it doesn't seem incredibly malicious and evil to us could read this passage and say, what what exactly is the sin? What exactly is it that Saul did that was so wrong? And there's a little bit of debate about this. Um, Some people think that what's going on is that the priest was the only one who was authorized to make sacrifices. And they think that what Saul is doing here is he is taking on a priestly role that he shouldn't take on because he's the king and he can't be a king and a priest unless you're Jesus much later on. He can't be a king and a priest. And so Saul here is doing something. He's sort of breaking the religious ritual by as a king authorizing sacrifices when only a priest was meant to do it. And it's possible that that's part of what's going on. But when Samuel shows up, what he talks about is him not obeying the Lord's command. He doesn't specify you as a king weren't supposed to offer sacrifices. He says you haven't obeyed the Lord's command. It seems like at the core, what Saul failed to do is he failed to obey God's command through Samuel to wait 
for Samuel. He got impatient, and if he asked him, he would say he had good reason for getting impatient, but he got impatient and decided to take matters into his own hands. And in fact, later on when Samuel arrives, Saul doesn't even deny it. He, he doesn't think that he hasn't disobeyed. He knows he's disobeyed. He just thinks he has a good reason for doing so because nobody has ever disobeyed God without believing that they had a good reason for doing so. Saul's sin at the core was simple disobedience, was looking at the fact that God had commanded something and saying, I think I have a better, uh, a better path than simple obedience to God. Um, in some ways, it's not so different from what we read in Genesis 3 about Adam and Eve. We read that story and we say, what's so wrong with eating a piece of fruit? The thing that's so wrong with eating the piece of fruit is that God said not to and Adam and Eve thought that they had a better plan. They disobeyed because they thought they had a good reason for doing so. And Saul here, his main problem is that he disobeys because he thinks he has a good reason for doing so. And, and this gets us to the crux of the matter. Again, I'm not gonna make a single excuse from Saul. for Saul. He should not have done this. He was wrong to do this. The disobedience was absolutely wrong and sinful and foolish. I'm not gonna make any excuses for, for him, but what I want you to see is that Saul is not that different from us. Saul faced a crisis. Saul felt pinned in. Saul did not go into this situation saying, I don't care what God says, I'm going to disobey. But he faced an ultimate test of obedience. And for Saul and for all of us, the test of obedience is when it requires us to choose faith over fear. Obedience isn't really that impressive when it's something that we want to do anyway. The true test of obedience is when obedience requires us to choose faith over the fears that we're facing. And Saul absolutely had fears and there's no way to say that those fears weren't legitimate. The Philistine army was really that daunting. Saul's men were really scattering. And when Saul looked around, Samuel really wasn't there and he really was late. It's not hard to understand how Saul would have looked at this situation and said, well, gosh, I'd, I'd like to obey God. In fact, I'm trying pretty hard to obey God, but the longer this goes on, the more concerned I am. Uh, I'm concerned because we can't beat that army. And I'm concerned because if my men start to scatter, it's gonna be hard to regather them for battle. Saul let his fears lead him to disobedience because he chose his fears over faith and over simple trust. And we, when we come to those crossroads, when we come to those moments, it really does put us in a position where we have to ask the question, how much do we actually trust God? Before the rest of the story, let, let's just pause and take this in for ourselves right now and, and recognize that. I, I know that there are times that there's something in us that, that we just kind of want to disobey a rule but for most of us, and probably for most of you listening, you don't want to go through your life disobeying God. You want to be obedient. You want to trust him. You want to walk with him. You want to obey his commands. Um, and frankly, even if you're listening to this and you're, you're, uh, you're not a Christian, you may be thinking, it's, it's not my goal in life to disobey God. I'd, I'd like to, in general, do the things that God would want me to do. We don't disobey because we're just trying to disobey. We disobey because we believe we have a good reason for doing so. And that good reason is almost always associated with fear. We don't lie just to lie. We lie because we're afraid of the kind of trouble we're going to end up in if we tell the truth. We don't explode in anger just to explode in anger. We often explode in anger because we're afraid that the person who wronged us is going to get away with it if we don't do something about it. Nobody gets an abortion just to get an abortion, just to kill a baby. Women get abortions because they're afraid that their lives are gonna be ruined if they don't do that. People get divorces, not because they want to break their vows, but because they're afraid that they're gonna be miserable if they don't go forward with the divorce. 
And for, for all of us, whatever it is, the indulgences and the appetites that we sometimes feed, whether it's getting drunk, whether it's getting high, whether it's some kind of casual sex, whether it's somehow feeding an appetite in a sinful way, the reason we do those things is not just because we wanna be rebellious. The reason that we do those things is often because we fear that we will be empty if we don't. We don't disobey just to disobey. We disobey because we believe we have a good reason for disobeying. And that good reason is the fear of what will happen if we do things God's way. And the fear that God's way won't end up paying off in the end. When we face these crossroads, it brings us to a point where we really do have to ask ourselves, how much do I trust God? Do I trust God enough that I'm gonna walk forward in obedience, believing that he's gonna follow through even though I don't see it right now? And let me just say, even right now, what we're dealing with, what we're dealing with in the shutdown and the timelines for reopening and the ambiguity about that and the frustrations about not knowing what's gonna happen and some of us having frustrations about government leaders and not knowing what they're gonna do and not knowing if they know what they're gonna do, uh, not knowing if they know what they're doing. When we're going through this, there often is a temptation for us to do something very similar to what Saul is doing here. Where Saul could have looked at this and he could have said, you know what, I was obedient for a long time. I was really patient. I really tried to do it your way, God. But there came a point where I needed to take matters into my own hands. And there are probably some of us that are looking at it and saying, you know what? I know what Romans 13 says about obeying the government authorities. I know what the Bible says about not speaking ill of other people and not slandering them. But you know what? I tried it that way for a long time and I've been pushed to my limit and now it's time to try my way. We don't disobey unless we think we have a good reason for doing so. And the good reason that we think we have is almost always associated with fear. Back to the story now. You know, when Samuel arrives, he and Saul have a showdown. In fact, Saul goes out to greet Samuel. He doesn't hide at all what he's done. He doesn't say, I never disobeyed. He basically says, yeah, I disobeyed, but I had a good reason for disobeying. I had a good reason for authorizing the sacrifice without you, Samuel. I mean, you were late, the Philistine army was strong and my men were scattering. So I know I disobeyed, but I had a good reason for disobeying. And Samuel says, you've done a very foolish thing. Then he says to Saul, you know what? God would have established your kingdom for perpetuity. He would have made you king, then your son king after you, then his son king after him, then his son king after him. That's what God would have done if you would have been obedient to him. But you've chosen not to be obedient to him, Saul. And so you know what's gonna happen? Your kingship is going to be taken from you. Your son, your descendants after you aren't going to be on the throne. In fact, God has already chosen a man after his own heart to be the king after you. Now hearing those words, for, for many of us, the first thought is just like, ah, it seems harsh. That seems like a harsh penalty for what Saul did. But here's what I want you to fixate in on with what Samuel just said. That is a big, bold thing to say to the king. Samuel the prophet is looking at the king and saying, hey, guess what? Your kingship isn't gonna go on. God has chosen another king to replace you. And imagine what Saul could have said. Saul could have looked at Samuel and said, do you realize who you're talking to? Do you realize what's going on here? I am the king. I am in charge. I sit on the throne. I have a crown on my head. I sound the trumpet and the armies come to me. You're telling me how it's gonna be? I am the king. I am in charge. And if he said that, Samuel's response probably would have been something like that. Yes, yeah, Saul, you're the king, but there's only one king of the kings. There's only one true ruler. So you may be the king, but God is the one who raises up rulers and takes rulers away. He's the one who puts them on the throne and he's the one who removes them from the throne. And so if we're going back to the question of saying, how am I gonna trust God in these moments where I'm so afraid what's gonna happen if I don't disobey him? 
And part of the answer is this, the one that you're trusting is the God who's powerful enough to snatch a person from obscurity and put them on a throne. And then in the next breath, to take them off the throne anytime he wants to. That is the power of the God that you are choosing to trust at those crisis moments. The true king of the kings who snatches people from obscurity and makes them significant and then puts them right back into obscurity simply at his word. There's only one king of the kings. And you you almost want to look at Saul here and say, Saul, I know the men were scattering. I know the Philistine army was big. But do you really think that for the God of the universe, that was a hard problem to solve? Do you really think that for the king of the kings, he couldn't have got you out of this mess? Saul, you should have trusted him because the problems that you are facing and the fears you are facing are not as big as the God who can take them on. And I just want to say, I I know that our fears are real. I know when we face those crisis moments, we're not making up the stakes. We're not imagining the problems that we could end up in. There are real reasons why we choose to disobey God. There are real fears that we all experience. But we've got to ask ourselves the question, do we really believe that God isn't able to handle those fears? Do we really believe that God isn't strong enough to get us out of those messes that we could end up in through our obedience to him? And man, I I just want to say that, you know, during this time, during all times, this is true, but especially during these times that that we're experiencing this much difficulty and knowing what's going to happen day to day. And when we experience, if we're just reading the news and looking around, what we experience is that the rulers of the world are the ones who are really in charge of what's going on out there. But here's what I want us to remember. President Trump is not ruling the world. Governor Newsom is not ruling the world. They are not the ones deciding how things are going to go down. No teacher and no employer who you sometimes are tempted to believe is running your life is really in charge of what happens tomorrow. And no spouse whose approval you believe your life depends upon is really in charge of how your life unfolds. There's only one king of the kings and no fear and no problem that we face is too daunting for him. Man, this is a time that we need to be in God's word regularly. This is a time where we need to dig in. I mean, right now, and if you're doing the LBF church Bible reading plan, we're going through amongst the Old Testament. We're also going through the gospel of John. We're hearing about Jesus. We're being reminded of who he is, that he has power over death, that he has power to open blind eyes, that eventually we're gonna see he has power to get back up after he's been dead. He is the king of the kings. And here's the even better news. The king of the kings, the one who will ultimately wear the, th- wear the crown, was willing to die for us. He was willing to sacrifice his life so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be welcomed into the family of God. The king of the kings is trustworthy because he is that powerful. And the king of the kings is trustworthy because he is that loving. And when we look at Saul, we see the tragedy of what happens when somebody chooses fear over faith. But, but I want you to imagine with me now, just take this, this is purely hypothetical. What if things had gone differently with Saul in this story? How might it have unfolded? What if Saul looked at the Philistine army and looked at his scattering men and he was scared and he was intimidated and men started to gather around him and say, if you don't offer the sacrifice, we're out of here. But what if Saul stuck to his guns? What if he said, you know what? Uh, uh, I see the army. I'm just as daunted by the army as you are. And I don't want the men scattering, but you know what? I trust God. We're going to do things his way. And maybe the men do start to scatter more than they did before. Maybe there's only a few dozen men left with Saul. And then Samuel arrives and offers a sacrifice. And Samuel arrives and God speaks to the Israelites and he thunders from heaven and the Philistine armies run scattered and then Saul and his troops run heroically down to fight. And then maybe some of the scattered men who had gone back to their homes see what's going on and they gather together in battle and God wins a glorious victory for them. And in the aftermath, Saul is deeply respected because he was willing to trust God even when it was really, really scary to do so. And not only is Saul respected, but much more importantly, all of the Israelites 
Israelites know that the battle belongs to the Lord. They trust God more fully because they saw what happened when their king was willing to obey, even when it was really difficult to do so. And I just wanna ask how many opportunities for God to show off his great deliverance do we miss out on because we choose to disobey out of our fears? How many times could we see God do amazing things that not only would bring blessing into our lives, but would show off God's power to the world around us so that more people would place their faith in Jesus because they'd see that God is a God who saves. Um, I'm no prophet, but here's something I'm gonna guarantee you. Sometime this week, you will face a crossroads of obedience. At some point this week, you're gonna be right in that moment where you know, I know what God wants me to do, but it's really scary to think what's gonna happen if I do it his way. And I see a much clearer path of leading myself to goodness if I go off road and do it my way. You will be faced with that crossroads at some point this week. It may be in a really big thing. It may be in a really small thing. At that moment, I want to encourage you, have the trust to move forward with God's way. Recognize that what you're dealing with is a lie. What you're dealing with is the lie that God's way doesn't pay off in the end. Trust God enough to walk forward in faith, trusting the one who's powerful enough to raise the dead and who's loving enough to give his life for you. Trust him in the moment. But I also want to say, get ready for the moment. Start getting ready now. Be in God's word. Read God's word. Man, take the life group lesson and at some point this week, go through it. Even if your life group isn't meeting so that you can dig deeper into this passage and what God wants to say to you through it. Pour out your heart to God in prayer. Express your fears and anxieties to him so that you are prepared for the crossroads moment and so that you're prepared to respond in a way that tells God, even though right now I feel like I have a good reason for disobedience, I'm gonna place my trust in you over the fears that I'm experiencing. Let me go ahead and pray for us. Father, thank you so much for this passage and thank you so much that you speak wisdom, even with stories that are from so long ago. Thank you that you have demonstrated over and over again that when we place our trust in you and when we walk forward in obedience, you never let us suffer shame. You always vindicate in the end. Please give us strength to trust you in the crossroads. Please give us wisdom to prepare for those crisis moments. And Father, please show off your deliverance and power so that others will see your great saving power and will place their faith in Jesus. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the true King of the Kings. Amen. God bless you. God bless you the rest of this week.